Few questions are as universal as, are we alone? And if our celestial neighbors are out there, who are they? Where are they? And should we fear them? These questions are just the tip of the iceberg, and just a few of the questions I got to explore with astrophysicist John Mather, who is also the senior project scientist on the James Webb Space Telescope, plus the first NASA scientist to win a Nobel Prize. In this video, we get to explore the mystifying secrets of space, where John takes us back billions of years to a time before the Big Bang, and also catapults us many moons into the future, one where evidence of our universe's origin may actually no longer exist. If you were to come back in uh, another, say, 100 billion years, most of the galaxies that we know about would have receded from us so far away that we couldn't see them anymore. So the universe will be in the process of appearing to empty itself out. And if you imagine going far enough into the future with just one Milky Way left, uh, all the other galaxies are gone, uh, the evidence of the history of the universe might have disappeared. So I'd like to invite you on this cosmic journey as we venture through wormholes, quantum entanglement, dark matter and dark energy, and the abyss of unanswered questions that scientists like John are trying to answer through technology. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security, and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. For more details, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. Why don't we actually kind of look at some of these images from um, James Webb, and maybe you could just speak to... Okay. Maybe even... Is there one that really, you think, shows us new features of understanding? Yeah. So we have something uh, that uh, Joe Biden released at the White House yes. on uh, July 11th last year, mm -hmm. and it shows uh, right, uh, quite a few remarkable things. There's some stars uh, mm -hmm. with six legs sticking out, uh, and that's just due to the wave nature of light. Uh, because light uh, sort of bends around the hexagonal edges of our mirrors, uh, so we but we knew about that. So stars are not that exciting right now. Uh, then in the middle of the picture are some giant fuzzy galaxies, enormously massive, and we sort of knew they were there already, and so that wasn't so exciting. But we wanted to know exactly how massive and exactly where all that stuff is. And then uh, in the background are little pink arcs. Um, curved things that do not look like galaxies, but they really are. Mm. And uh, so they are highly magnified and distorted images of very, very distant objects. Okay. And nature has given, given us lenses, extra lenses in space, to magnify uh, the more distant universe. And this is something that Einstein predicted, and we never thought it would be useful, uh, except in the most abstract way. But So now what we see is sometimes two or three or four or five images of the same distant object, all stretched out and magnified. So this is a way to look farther back in time uh, to see the details of the various first galaxies. Mm -hmm. So that's the coolest thing for the astronomer in that picture. Um, so sometimes we even see that the, the early galaxy is filled up with a little sparkly things. We call them globular clusters, like 100,000 stars. Uh, that were presumably formed together. And now our big question is, well, which came first, galaxies or globular clusters? Did the universe make the little clusters first and then they join together? Or did the galaxy form first and then break up into little clusters? So this is one of our generic questions of which came first, chickens or eggs mm -hmm. or breadfruit? I don't know. <laughs> um, so... Um, by the, which brings me to another question about early galaxies. There's a black hole giant black hole in every galaxy, just about. Yes. And so uh, we know they're there uh, because we see things orbiting around them. So we calculate that there's some immensely massive object in the middle. Sometimes they're very bright because material is falling in and getting compressed to enormous temperatures, and we can see that part. And now we want to know, uh, well, which came first, the galaxy or the black hole? Uh, did the universe start off with black holes all over the place? <clears throat> Or did it uh, make galaxies first and then they made the black holes? So we've begun to observe black holes out there. 
We've even, even seen a few years ago black holes colliding with each other and joining together to make bigger black holes. This is with the James Webb? or now, That was done with the LIGO Observatory, okay. which is here on the ground. Uh, and uh, we've even, even more remarkably seen neutron stars colliding and making a bigger neutron star. And that has its own story to tell because, for instance, when you look at your ring, if you have a wedding ring mm-hmm, of gold, then we know that most of the gold in that wedding ring came from neutron stars that collided and, and blew up and uh, material came back out into space as it was recycled. So this is a part of the most astonishing story about our own origins, mm-hmm. that we're made out of not only recycled stars, but uh, neutron stars that collided and blew up. And so uh, our own personal story has got the most remarkable threads in it. And I just want to ask you about this particular image, um, which has been referenced a lot in terms of understanding exoplanets and the composition of them. And perhaps you could speak to maybe what we've learned there and also what it may indicate in terms of life that we have maybe come across, not come across. I think the answer is the latter, but also what that maybe opens up for the future. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, everybody wants to know, are we alone? Yes. And uh, if we're not alone, where are the neighbors? So I'll give you my, I'll jump ahead to the, what I think the answer is. I think the answer is, no, we're not alone. And I think life will occur quite frequently, but it will mostly be a rather elementary. Uh, and uh, when you look at the history of Earth, you see the history of the different forms of life growing. It's taken all of the entire history of the universe for us to turn up. Mm-hmm. So that does tell us that we're kind of rare in history. Uh, so... Probably life is everywhere that it could be, which is perhaps in conditions like ours where it's, there's liquid water at about the right temperature. So, but probably we're not going to find the neighbors. Uh, similarly, that we're not in danger from the neighbors. So uh, maybe we got lots of unexplained things here on planet Earth, but it's not very likely to be space aliens. Yeah. Something else that we don't understand instead. So, um, so what are we going to do about measuring Well, of course, here in the solar system, we're sending out probes to land on Mars and visit other places where there could be life um, and see. So on Mars, we're working to bring back little rocks that have the chance of having fossils in them. So that's really hard, but we're working on it. We're already putting the rocks in little caches to get ready to bring them home. Yeah. Um, We are sending probes out to orbit around satellites of Jupiter and Saturn where... um, Water is coming out. Uh, there are places where the, there's a liquid water ocean uh, covered with ice. And there are cracks in the ice, and the water comes out, and you can see something. And so if we're lucky, we might find out there are organic molecules in those oceans. Fascinating. I would say maybe there's life under there. And, and so it would give us impetus to f- track it down and find out more. Um, so then we get to uh, what can we do about other planets around other stars can we find places that are like home, uh, little Earths orbiting stars like the sun? So far, uh, we don't know of any like that uh, because it's a really hard observational problem. Mm-hmm. What we're doing at the web, uh, we are looking at um, planets orbiting other smaller stars uh, that are called M stars. So these are very weak little stars that are hardly as big as Jupiter. But they're warm enough <laughs> Hardly to... Hardly as big as Jupiter. It's just funny with our, with our sizes. Yeah. yeah tiny little well, humans. Well, just to, as a matter of scale, yeah. Earth is 8,000 miles across. Uh, Jupiter is 88,000 miles yeah. across. And the sun is about a million miles mm-hmm. across. It's good frame. So, good reference. Uh, roughly each one is 10 times bigger than the other. So, um, so yes, we're able to study uh, planets around small stars mm-hmm. because if some of the time the little planet will go, will go in front of the star and it'll block some starlight. So, okay, now we know it's there. Uh, we can calculate its temperature and its size and whether it might possibly host an ocean. Okay, now does it have an atmosphere? So, yes, maybe. Uh, so look to see if any of the starlight's going through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to the telescope. And, um, yeah, we can do this. And we have a pretty large catalog of large planets that do have an atmosphere with interesting molecules in them. And so the technique works. And now we're just now busy analyzing the small stars that have potentially small Earth-like planets. And uh, I can't say that we're really surprised, but so far the little ones do not have atmospheres that we can tell. So we shouldn't be too disappointed because we didn't really expect it. 
but we still but do really know. want to know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what's what's next in this subject? Well, we need to build different telescopes. Mm, tell me we more about that. We are finishing up one now called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, and it will have an equipment to look for planets as direct images, uh, a, a device called a coronagraph. So if we can get that to work, uh, you never know. We might see some signs of a more or less Earth-like planet. And the next one we're going to build is called Habitable Worlds Observatory. And so when we do that, we'll be able to see an image with a little dot next to the other big dot, and it'll be an Earth-like object around a star like the sun, which is a much more likely place to find uh, uh, signs of life. Because, mm -hmm. of course, we've got one observation, which is us. Yeah. Uh, here we are. So th please look for another place like us. So we're building that, or I should say we will be building that because that's what <clears throat> NASA wants to build. The Congress wants to build it. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences said to build it. Astronomers want us to build it. And I think the public wants us to build this because, oh, well, I sure want to know. We all want to know, are we alone? We want to know. I mean, let me ask you a tangential question, which is just there's just still so many question marks about this universe around us. Um, is there a specific question mark that you know, you would just love to see solved in your lifetime. You would love that answer, just even out of personal interest. There's yeah, something so gnawing at you. I guess the the ones that are obvious, uh, that already are recognized by thousands of scientists, the cosmic dark energy, cosmic dark matter, uh, they seem to be there. We can describe them mathematically. Uh, they seem to fit practically everything that we know. Um, and we did not expect them. There was no sort of basic understanding of anything that said they should be there. Maybe just for the listeners, could you explain what both of those are, dark energy yeah. and dark matter? So cosmic dark matter appears to be um, transparent. We shouldn't call it dark. We should call it transparent. There's a lot more of it than there is of ordinary matter, the protons and neutrons and atoms that you all see every day. Um, so it's out there. It has been detected by its gravity. So back in the 1930s, we already had a hint that galaxies were spinning too fast, which means they're being held together by more gravity than you can find. You cannot find the uh -huh. stars to explain that amount of gravity. So something, something is weird. So it took f from then until about 1980-something before we had a lot more evidence. And we could say, yeah, this is really there. Um, how, do we know what it is? No. Uh, we have been hunting in laboratories uh, for decades. And darn it, there isn't a single thing that's ever said this is a good promising candidate. So that means it's a wide open mystery. Mm -hmm. um, then we have the cosmic dark energy, you know, which is um, something that in principle Einstein imagined. Uh, he, there's a place in his equations of the universe that could be called dark energy. Uh, but we thought, uh, generally, astronomers thought that, well, that would never happen. So we imagined and, and believed that the universe expansion will be slowing down because gravity will pulling, is pulling on things and will slow the expansion, which seems to be true up for the first roughly 10 billion years of the expanding universe, or 9 billion. And then it seems to be accelerating. <laughs> so who asked for that? Well... Uh, it was discovered uh, by people who were planning to measure the deceleration. Mm -hmm. And oh, well, there's something wrong here. <laughs> so they got a Nobel Prize for discovering the acceleration. It's mm -hmm. going faster and faster every year, which means that uh, if you were to come back in uh, another, say, 100 billion years, most of the galaxies that we know about would have receded from us so far away that we couldn't see them anymore. Mm. So the universe will be in a process of appearing to empty itself out. And if you imagine going far enough into the future with just one Milky Way left, uh, all the other galaxies are gone, um, the evidence of the history of the universe might have disappeared from Oh, that's science. fascinating. We it's might still, not. Just to confirm, though, you're saying it still exists. It would just be so far away we that so, we can't Yeah, too far away to it. see it. Wow. So, so anyway, we are here at a particularly interesting time where we still have evidence and can trill, write the story and tell ourselves how we, did we get here from something. What comes before the Big Bang? That's kind of like what our, at least my brain was coming to as well, right? There's, there is the Big Bang, and then you have all of this matter expanding, creating galaxies, et cetera. But like, I don't, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around this idea of what comes before it. Yeah, well, maybe that's because maybe there isn't anything before <laughs> it. So the way I think about it is uh, 
sort of from the observer's perspective. Because what we see today is distant galaxies running away from us, and we see the cosmic microwave radiation that tells us what it was like when it was young. And we imagine running it backwards in our minds. Yes. So, Like a play button, literally. like Run the play button backwards. So the galaxies go crushing together. The, the stars are ripped apart. The, the temperature goes up and up. Eventually, the atoms are ripped apart. Even the protons mm-hmm. and neutrons are ripped apart and separated into quarks. And then we uh, picture this uh, soup of quarks and, uh, and leptons, they're called. And then we say, well, what came before that? And so we have guessed, we have a guess that there's something called an inflation field, a, a purely conceptual quantum mechanical idea. And we say, if this could happen in this particular way, then it would produce the expanding universe that we have today. And so it seems to hold up in the sense that uh, there are a few predictions that it makes that uh, we verified by observation of the cosmic background radiation. So I, when this was first proposed, I thought, well, that'll, that'll never work. We'd never know. But there is a little bit of evidence that this cosmic inflation story could be correct. Uh, so, But it's still pretty much of a guess. Mm-hmm. So then you say, well, what could come before that? And, and what does the theory predict? So the theory predicts maybe there could be other universes um, erupting out of this inflation field. Um, and we would never know they were existing. Um, there could be billions or trillions or an infinite number of other universes according to this idea, mm-hmm. and we'd never know. Um, but because this is so much of a guess, we honestly can't tell you what came before that. Yeah. And then we get to what about quantum gravity, which we touched on very briefly. Um, if um, quantum mechanics should apply to space and time themselves, then... Um, what happens if time and space don't mean what they seem to mean anymore? And then kind of all bets are off. That means <laughs> yeah. um, we are completely confused. We have no successful theoretical predictions based on that idea of quantum gravity. Uh, doesn't mean there isn't any, but we then it gets into all the wonderful questions about wormholes and, and uh, qu- quantum entanglement and the other mysteries of Modern science and engineering. Oh, boy. My yeah. uh, cosmic so, dust brain is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, my cosmic dust brain is not able to do that either. Uh, but somebody will be working on it, and some people are working on it, and yeah. uh, we might get some breakthroughs. Thank you so much for listening to the A16Z podcast. What we're trying to do here is provide an informed, clear-eyed, but also optimistic view of technology and its future. And we're trying to do that by featuring some of the most inspiring people and the things they're building. And so if you believe in that and you'd like to join us on this journey, make sure to click subscribe, but also let us know in the comments below what you'd like to see us cover next. Thank you so much for listening and we will see you next time. 